mysteriously died and I think there was quite a few so yeah it was um, quite interesting when going to the audition. Stan, tell us that. Well I've been trying to think how to put this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is they were expecting me to know who Crom was. <laughs> but the truth is I had no idea <laughs> who Crom or what <laughs> I hadn't even read the books, alright? Uh, I was at school and I literally bumped into one of the casting agents of the film and that, that's how it all started with me. So um, I got familiar with my character after I was called into the studios to get the body cast for the part with the shark, where obviously now I know what happens, but... 
back then, everyone was really excited, saying, you know, this is crowd, you know, turning into a shark, saying, you know, Miami, and I was just nodding as if, you know, <laughs> So I, I, I thought, you know, I might as well just get the book and read and see what I've gotten myself into. <laughs> so I got the book, I read it, and I was like, damn, man, well, this is serious. <laughs> That's how it happened with me. Fantastic. <laughs> So, we were talking about this a little bit earlier backstage, but there actually seems to be a little bit of debate about whether or not you even consider your characters to be antagonists. So, let's, let's go down the line. Well, I mean, Kirsty, yeah. Uh, he's not a bad... He's not a bad guy, right? <laughs> wow. He just, he just gets it a bit wrong. Yeah. Really? I mean, I can talk about... Obviously, I can talk about this for days, so don't start. But, um, but, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Like, the, the really short version of it is that I think Percy isn't anywhere near as intelligent as everyone seems to assume he is because he's always got his head in a book and he's always doing his homework. And I think that's actually because he's not as clever as, like, Bill and Charlie, uh, who are sort of the people he's always been compared to when he was a kid because he was the ones above him. So he's always had to sort of work that extra bit harder to be as good as his brothers and Ginny, his sister. Um, so I don't think he's, I don't think he's as bad as a comics man to be. He's just very keen to do as well as he can, and he kind of goes about that the wrong way. But he's not bad. He's not bad. He just he just thinks that. Thank you. One person. He just he wants to do the best he can, and he gets the wrong idea about what the difference between right and good. Yeah. Is. Do you think perhaps maybe his ambition is blinding him a little? Yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. He like. I, if it wasn't for the fact that he come, oh god, I can go out on this today. Sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you want to take ten minutes, um, he should be a Slytherin um, because he's more ambitious than he is brave. But he's brave at the end when he comes back and holds his hands up and says, "I made a mistake." So I don't know. Yeah. He, he yeah. It certainly takes guts to do that, especially. Yes. Yeah. 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 But he's he's definitely more ambitious than he is anything else. So. Good answer. But he's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think Pansy Parson definitely is. I don't think there's any argument now. I think we can agree that she is. Um, but no, she was a lot of fun to play, and I do think at times she's misunderstood. Um, like when? I don't know. <laughs> When, and since I've been doing more of the cons, you know, I've had people who are in Slytherin who always say, you know, I really do think she's misunderstood, and I really feel like she was one of, you know, Drake was like really, really good friends and like true friends, and you know, so she is capable of having friendship and feeling love and things like that, and you know, and I feel like I know she was the one who kind of said, oh, Harry Potter's there. And, she was responsible for sending all the Slytherins to the dungeon. <laughs> I, I feel like that was more out of fear, you know, I would not describe her as necessarily being brave, even though I do think that is you know, the old thing to do. Um, but I do think it's more out of fear, but I feel like she was trying to uh, maybe just save herself, so yeah, she is an antagonist. Um, but no, I, I uh, like I said, she was really fun to play and interesting. And if anyone else feels like she's misunderstood, please come find me and tell me why. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun to hear. Uh, absolutely, please, absolutely. Um, I think you know, just you can't have a mother like you have, uh, what Blaze has. Uh, can't grow the way that he's had to grow. We're obviously, seeing a lot of um, you know a lot of men go in, in his time. I would assume. Um, but I think just even when playing Blaze on set, just trying to bring out that sort of attitude and the bad in him. Um, I'd say for me, I'm 100%, 100% with Blaze just because of how he is. Uh, he doesn't take kindly to models, doesn't take kindly to, you know, hard words. Um, so I think the answer to that would be absolutely, definitely. <laughs> I think that's honestly the most cut and dry of the four of you. Like with Pansy, I mean, you can maybe say a little bit that like because J.K. Rowling put all of like every bad memory she had from her school days of girls bullying her kind of into that one character, there's maybe a little bias there, right? That she didn't really have a chance to grow beyond that. But yeah, Blaze, I think, yeah, pretty yeah. bad for stuff. Yeah, I think so, definitely, definitely. What about you, Sam? <laughs> I would 
always call a bad guy. <laughs> the dark arts. Uh, how is that a bad thing? Bad <laughs> <laughs> association, maybe. <laughs> he, he takes Romani to the ball, he's the world's best Quidditch player. He, take, uh, he takes Romani away from my little brother. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> he from gets Romani first. That's right. Yes. Trump <laughs> gets there first. And, oh. he, and he was that bad that he, she was driven into the arts. <laughs> So, for all of you, do you think, for your character, that if they had, you know, made, made some different choices, perhaps, or maybe, you know, had, had some different friends, things could have gone differently for their character? Do you think that there's the capacity inside them to, to turn out maybe better or different? I've seen them in different places. places. I'd, li I'd like to be positive and say I think so. I just don't know what else Percy would do. <laughs> the only thing he's good at is being told what to do <laughs> and telling other people what to do. Like I can't I, imagine. That, yeah, he's just he, bless it. <laughs> Maybe just let his family tell him to do those. Maybe, but yeah, I don't know. But could you imagine? Like, could you imagine if Percy hadn't been a head boy and he hadn't been? school prefects and he hadn't gone to work, what would he have done? Like, he couldn't have worked behind the counter in we the, was it in the Weasley shop or like, I don't know. Be shut up in his bedroom yeah. and have a collar bottle of yeah. this or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he couldn't do anything else, like, he's, he's yeah, that's it. <laughs> What's the most fun thing about playing an antagonist or a foil or whoever you want to frame it in the context of your character? <laughs> Just so fun playing a baddie. <laughs> That's it, just simple. You know? Yeah, but it's just a lot of fun, and I feel like you get to explore your characters a lot more, and I don't know, it's just a fun exercise to be a little bit naughty. There's always a reason why bad guys are bad. There's never a reason why good guys are good, is there? It's like they're just good. It's not good, they're not good because something good happen to them in their childhood, whereas bad people are always bad because there's a reason, there's a causation for that badness, generally. So the, the, yeah, how they got to bad is always way more interesting than why somebody's good. I've had way too much coffee. <laughs> I enjoyed playing um, Blaze just because, obviously growing up, there were so many times where you know, things didn't go your way, or you'd always have to conduct yourself in a certain way. But on set, it's like, you know, if you wanted to bring that attitude out, or you wanted to walk around moody all day, you couldn't. No one could really say much like Lewis and Trotter, I'm in character, leave them alone. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, I just, just leave me, I'm in character. So I, I think that was the good part, because I don't, uh, I don't like to see myself as a bad person. I'd like to think I've got a good heart. Um, I would always be kind and, and polite, and you know, go out of my way for others. But, you know, I think with, with Blaze, it was just, if I didn't want to, yeah, if I, if I was on set and I wanted to act moody and just have a face like, you know, if I wanted my lips pushed out, I could do it and no one would be able to say anything. So it was, uh, it was quite fun. It was quite fun, definitely. It's not very difficult playing a character who doesn't really speak. <laughs> Thomas when 
um, standing in the dome strands. Yeah, so when Stan and, and um, you know, the rest of the dome strands were there, and we were the coolest. Yeah, no, I don't know. Oh, you hang on the wrong one. Oh, yeah, that was that. That was that. So, obviously, Stan and I, we, we did go back, and it was just, I think, even though it wasn't out there, you could see that there was not intimidation, but, you know, you've got all of these big guys coming in, and everyone else is, everyone's known each other on set. So, when there was just loads of new guys coming in, I can remember there being a lot of talk. Um, not that it was negative, but that you could, you could definitely see that it was rough, you know, rough and some purpose in and around the people on set, definitely. In a good, in a good way, a good competition. Good competition. Would you agree, Sam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many words. But I mean, the only weird, the only weird thing was that when we, were, I mean, because obviously when it was all the Gryffindors together, it was just the Gryffindors. But and when I was around, it was either sort of in the Gryffindor bit or in the Great Hall. And in the Great Hall, because we were all separated into tables, we were still very much like, just Gryffindors would hang out together, and Slytherins would be like three tables that way and all the rest. But it also meant that like where the Gryffindor, where the Gryffindors went to sit, were offset was on a different side of the Great Hall. So quite often we just kind of were naturally segregated anyway, which was a bit strange. Yeah. And I don't know whether they did that on purpose, whether there was like some kind of producer plan to kind of really set the guard against each other or not, or whether it was just easier that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I seem to remember it was always kind of just the Gryffindors would all hang out, and then there'd be Tom and Jamie and Josh, and they'd kind of sit over there and do their thing and do their bad boy thing. Yeah. <laughs> For the three of you, what was it like coming into a set that was already so, you know, familial and this, this long-standing thing? Did you find it really easy to kind of integrate, or was it really just sort of a process of kind of figuring everything out? Well, I was really relieved because I wasn't the only new person um, at the time when I joined for this for the Half-Blood Prince. There was, you know, a whole bunch of us and there were other girls too and it really did feel like I was going to a new school because I got the role when I was, what, 16, just turning 17. Um, so, like I said, I was still in high school and, you know, studying for my exams and things like that. So, it was a really interesting experience to feel like I was coming into a new school at Hogwarts, but for me, everyone was so welcoming and, um, you know, like I said, there were other girls there too and I didn't feel like the new kid as such and it was more of an excitement of, oh, who's this person? And you know, there was just a lot of love, so I'm really grateful for that and they're still really good friends, so. Um, for me, it was, because uh, as, as I said earlier, I was Dean Thomas's double and I, I'll never forget watching, I was at home with my mother and the film had finished, Harry Potter music come on, and I'd obviously been told that was too tall, and I broke down in tears. I will never forget it to this day, I would actually sit there sobbing to the Harry Potter, and I'm oh, going back to Hogwarts. <laughs> <laughs> it was that that inspired me, so I went and pushed, got the role, and it was like going, you know when you, yeah, how do I put it, you know when you have a holiday, and then you go back, you go back to school. You feel like yeah, like you may have a new haircut, and you want to walk in and just be like, hey, you're back. Um, so for me, it was like going, back to school and just meeting and seeing everyone. So when I got on set, it was just like, I had to take it all in. I was just trying to absorb everything at every single moment because I, you know, I'd been on that other other side where you, you're told you're not going back, so to be back, uh, I just enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> well, since I said I had no idea, what was going on. Um, <laughs> it was um, a strange feeling. I thought, you know, I felt as if I was going to a new school again. Um, but Warner Brothers were really great at making sure we all knew each other really well before we started filming. Uh, we had like an introductory period that lasted for um, two weeks. They had all of us together and we played games, ate cake. <laughs> Yeah, had a lot of fun together, so uh, we knew each other before um, actual filming began, so I didn't feel quite the new guy in school. 
um, because Crown turned out to be a superhero. So <laughs> yeah, everyone was really excited about him, and there was that thing going on, you know, around the world with the secret, not you know letting anything slip out and let the world know who Crown would be. And I really was like, oh, I want to tell everybody now. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was it was great fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I do remember that. When I found out I got it, I wasn't allowed to say anything. And my mum, love her, but she is a gossip. And I was like, mum, it's really important. I was like, you cannot tell anyone. This is a really big deal. Please don't say anything. And I remember I had started school, and there was actually another girl, Izzy, when she, she, we went to the same high school together. And so we just, it was nice because I didn't feel like I was alone in this big secret. <laughs> we were like kind of together. And so we go to set, and then we go to school and try and keep everything. Super quiet. You see, I, when I, we, I had the same thing when I started, with, but back in 2000, like, the internet was still this weird thing that we didn't really understand what we were doing. But, like, remember, remember back in the days of, like, dial-up and, 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 and forums, yeah, the dial -up. and I, 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 we had, I had the same thing, I had this, you, you could not tell anything, and this was, I got cast at the end of August, and I think, finally, I was allowed to talk to people about it in, like, February. So it's a long time to like for people going, where have you been? And you're like, I've not been in school for the last six months. It's <laughs> um, but in my, because I was a Harry Potter fan anyway, I read the books and like, I, was, I was totally into that. I wanted to know what everyone was talking about, what everyone was saying. I, was, I joined the Harry Potter forum. Um, I can't I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, it was great. I still got friends on the internet that I met from that But I signed up with this really anonymous username, which was I am Percy Weasley. Because <laughs> 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 um, yeah. well, no, I did because I seen, I think I can't remember exactly, but nobody even like I think they just thought I really liked Percy Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> but I really did like Percy Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> That's made it happen. UH UHPMS? Is anybody here old enough to remember that? To want to tell me if that's a thing? Is that a thing? It was a thing. It was like that. It was something like that. Yeah. It was a long time ago. What is your singular favorite memory from filming? If you had to choose just one thing. Take your time thinking. That's really difficult. There was so many. There was so, so many. Um, I think for me it was the roof of the car, <laughs> just the whole scene. Um, yeah, just the set was unreal. Um, I remember having to do about a month's worth of uh, stunt training before actually being allowed to go on set to film the scenes that we needed to film. Um, I'll never forget that Tom and I were you know, on top of the table pretending that we were having to be rescued. I think that was, it was the scariest, one of the scariest scenes well, the scariest scene I've ever filmed, um, but at the same time the most exciting scene because we're up there. I'm not even exaggerating, it's probably as the table was literally as high as the ceiling, probably a little bit higher. And yeah, we're strapped in, but um, I, I'll never forget we get up there and they're like, Right, Lewis, Tom, we need you to uh, you know, really look scared. And we're up and we're like, We ain't got to act this scene. <laughs> You know, when it comes to heights, um, I think the only, the only way that I can describe it is like, in, a, in, in the UK we've got a, a ride called the Detonator at Thorpe Park, which literally takes you up and it drops you, you don't know when you're going to drop. Um, and that was exactly that scene, they're like, right, we're not going to tell you when, we're gonna, when it's going to drop, just know that we're filming, so we're still there, and we're like, okay, okay, and next thing, and you literally <laughs> um, So that, and that scene for me, yeah, the room requirement, and, um, you know, being, being rescued by I run, which is pretty cool. I imagine it must have been super gratifying to see what the final scene looked like that too. Yeah, yeah, it was, I think it was a funny thing because I remember having to do the scene where I get rescued and I've done my scene and I'm, I'm waiting for Tom to come in to do his scene where obviously Harry rescues him and, and they bring the stunt double.
Yeah, really. Or a memory connected to the films. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll just go for it. Um, it was... Well, I was filming for a long time, so a lot of memories, but one that's um, just come up now in my head and I'll have to share it with you. <laughs> was that the premiere? I remember getting out the car and everything was really well organized and rehearsed. And the moment I came out the car, I saw that, I think it was pink, pink flying through the sky at me, and it was a bra. <laughs> <laughs> I was only 20. So, and uh, he had a note saying, marry me. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, catching that thing and just saying, oh, let's see who that belongs to. <laughs> together um, and we worked on that for what two or three weeks? Well, I think we started time? filming on it, it but then a long time. if you remember this, no. we did have what in the courtyard? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was, it was a long time. time. Yeah, we started and the stage caught fire. Yeah, we did, we did it and then we came back and did it again. Yeah, to do it again, yeah. Well, know, well we were really happy, I mean, we all didn't see each other, but again, I yeah, no, it was, um, that, that, I would say that would be, we did, a, we did a bit of it without Rupert there. Do you remember? Because he's got because stung by a bee or something. Yeah, something. <laughs> like, <laughs> remember there was this weird thing I was like, this is like, it's rude. Yeah, then no, I was goes for that. I got stung by a bee. That was really fun. That was great. That was great. And then at the end we all took this huge like crew and cast photo with everyone together. That was a weird day. It was weird yeah. because it didn't feel, it just felt like we were all going to be back the following week, we were all going to see each other. It and did. it actually ended up being like the final day. But yeah, because on, on your last day, they do this thing where they kind of read out, you know, well, they say, like, when you finish the day and the first assistant director, you know, basically call, calls a rap for the end of the day. You're clap. And then what kind of. But as, as the film was coming to an end, they were sort of announcing everyone who was finishing on that day. So every time it was somebody's last day, there'd be a little round of applause to go, oh, it was so and last day, oh, wait, lovely. And then that particular day, there was about 30 so many, of us, yeah. and literally, he just basically read out the entire call sheet. Yeah. And I remember none of us left. Like, everyone else, everyone else was like, right, cool, all the gaffers and the cameramen were all, like, packing their stuff off, <laughs> going home, and, and, and cars leaving the set, and, and there was all of us kind of stood there going, Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. remember, yeah, there was about 20 of us, wasn't there? Yeah. That was a, that was a happy Saturday. Yeah. That would be me. That's probably going to be mine as well, so we can all share that. I think we got, well, uh, I remember obviously having that, and then like a week later, or two weeks later, being like, you get a call, like, maybe you're, you're back in, I'm like, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do this, yeah, like, let's go. Um, yeah, but I, I do remember the, you know, the, the, the last scene then, but, yeah. What's the most important thing about embodying a, a villain or a foil for you? What, what is the, your secret sauce that you, you take into that process? Just really go for it. Yeah. You know, to really own the fact that yeah. you are a baddie. Any, like, method acting, you can get into the headspace. No, I don't. I don't, especially with the body. I don't feel like I could do that and go home and still be really like unpleasant to be around. I feel like I'm really nice all the time and I pride myself on being a nice person. So no, I'd rather keep that for set and have fun with it and then go home and be like, oh, my sauce, I'm, you know, I'm myself again. That's it. But I would say that, be really confident no matter what the role is. So much of it is about having a 
a certain level of confidence, you know, in being, I don't know, really owning the certain decisions and choices that you make when you are on set or when you are working. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, for me, I think it was because I played in, in the US in soccer um, and I get so frustrated when I'm losing, like I hate losing. Anything I do, I, I want to win, like I want to be the winner. Um, so I think it was like I'd walk on set just thinking I've lost a football match and, and if you see me after a football match I'm late, like I am that guy, I will be in the change room just like talking. I leave you alone. No, I actually remember that because I would come like really early on set and we were working quite a bit and I'd be like, morning! And he'd just be there like, hey. <laughs> cool. Listen, see you later, see you at lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah. I probably love to get the ping pong or, or something. Like that. <laughs> so yeah, I think that, that was how I'd, I'd approach. Yeah, I'd just make up like I've lost the game and, and just walk on set and just, just come. I think with them, with Percy, it was always it was just fun because he was just so disapproved. It? Like he's he's a for the, in the film, he, he sort of his sole purpose is there to be the sort of the anti climax to everything that they try and do. It's like oh, we're going to do that. Um, so it's just that kind of ha uh ha. -uh, I've stopped you again. Bad luck. Um, and he's always so smug about it, like that's what I always liked about Percy, there's always that kind of, he's always slightly, it's an amazing expression, that I can't remember who said it, I can't remember who they, who they described it as, but it's like, but it looks like he's chewing a wasp, it's like all the time, like, <laughs> and with the little eyebrow, he's always like, no you're not, uh -uh. not gonna happen guys, um, and I always quite like that about Percy, he's like, he's always the one that everyone's like, oh, here again. Like, why is he in the dungeons? Why is he in the dungeons? We don't know, but he is. And you know what? You're not going to have one because he's. Um, but I like that about him because he's always, yeah, just, just always a pain. <laughs> Leading off of that, I suppose, do you prefer to play antagonist or protagonist? I think it's more fun. Oh, Baddie's always more fun. Yeah. Oh, definitely. But I, I would really like to play someone normal and nice. <laughs> I mean, I always get cast as the baddie, which again is fun, but you know, I would like to play someone maybe who doesn't have powers or doesn't fly or isn't a witch or a vampire or it's all I seem to do, <laughs> which is really fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I'd like to play someone really normal. <laughs> Well, being, you know, playing Crumb was, uh, I was fortunate to have really big scenes with a lot of people in them. So, going on set, having, for example, 30 girls chase you. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, literally you're just stretching out and then them giggling behind you, you're like, yeah, buddy. <laughs> so, that being, you know, I, it was easy for me, or, you know, like the entrance to the maze, I remember I had my whole gang cheering for me, so of course I would come out and be like, yeah, this is real, man, I'm, I'm very proud here. <laughs> so it was quite easy, but as I said, Crom is not a baddie. <laughs> so do you prefer the, the superstar Crom or the classic villain? No, the superstar sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I, 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 Sorry, I um, I always seem to be cast as like a villain um, or you know the bad guy, and, and I don't mind because, as I say, it, it, for me it's easy to get in that frame of mind. I just picture myself as losing something, so it's easy just just switching to that. Um, but I think going forward, I'd love, and I think that people that look after me here, um, they will be able to vouch for this. I'm a weird, like I'm, 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 a, I'm a weirdo. Like I am a weirdo. I've got a funny side. It's like I will. Switch. You know, I think Chris has even seen because Chris and I have been working quite a lot. Like a this. Yeah. So <laughs> I'd love to do like a comedian part. I'd love to be a comedian, like a fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know, if, I, <laughs> if I could get something like that, um, I think that would be like my dream role because I could just bring out that other side of me. Because you know, a lot of the time I have to walk around and obviously be act normal, um, but behind closed doors, yeah, I'm far from.
<laughs> Comedian would be my, uh, my perfect role. Hey. All right, I think we are going to open up to audience questions. Uh, we'll get a, a microphone set up if you guys want to line up uh, single file. Uh, you can state your name and your Hogwarts house, please, before you deliver your question. And if you're posing a question to an individual, just say who it's for. Hi. You did not. I know. My name is Tanika, and I'm a Ravenclaw. Uh, I was just wondering, is there a scene from the books with your characters that you were sad didn't make it into the movies? Yeah. <laughs> All of Goblet Fire for Percy. <laughs> um, but, um, but, no, but specifically for me, actually, there's, there's one very specific bit that we filmed for Percy that didn't make it because they cut leaves the poltergeist, and there was a hot, there was a little section. It's only probably I don't know, like 30 seconds of story, but it's where Percy in the first year is bumped into Peeves on the way up to the Gryffindor common room for the first time. And it was, yeah, it it, you know, Peeves never turns up in the film, sadly, but, and it doesn't bear an awful lot of, sort of, it doesn't have much importance to the rest of the story, so I don't even really get why it's, it's gone, but it was just such a fun bit to shoot. And Rick Mayle, who was playing Peeves, who's also sadly no longer with us, was just the funniest guy. I think I've ever had the misfortune to work with. Um, <laughs> honestly, I was 16, and, I, and, and like Rick, Rick Mayer in the UK, I, and I think he, he's in sort of, he appears over here as a counterculture, and if, if you're into kind of weird British comedy, you'll, you'll know who he is, but he's very odd and very funny. And as a 16 year old, I was like totally in more of him. And he taught me all sorts of things about how, how to keep a very straight face. Um, he also taught me a lot of very rude words. Yeah. <laughs> and we've had a great time. Um, yeah, yeah. So I wish that little bit, just that little bit, was it. Mine wasn't necessarily from the books itself, but in the final film, I shot a scene with David Bradley, who played Filch, and it was when all the Slytherins got put into the dungeon. And it was so much fun yeah. to shoot because, you know, I start shouting at him, and he says something back, and he locks us in, and then he walks out, and then what happens is, we were all told, okay, there's going to be an explosion, I thought. Yeah. Real fun. And, um, you know, when we actually came out to shooting it, they said, literally before we were about to shoot, they said, okay, do you want, like, um, earplugs? And I said, no, 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 I'll be fine. And they said, no, I really think you should have them. I was like, okay, just be, you know, just be sure. So I, I put them in, and, I, you know, we didn't think it was going to be big. And when it went off, it, it so was like an it was, Oh it was my like god, it was huge. I don't actually think it was supposed to be as big as the <laughs> Not really. Like, we freaked out to the point where I almost laughed on set out of nervousness. You know, when you ever get really scared and you just kind of laugh, I mean, that's what I do. And that's what happened. And because you were there as well, and it was crazy. But it was really fun to shoot. And then we had to run out screaming. And, you know, that's when all the Slytherins are free. But, um,. Yeah, that didn't sadly make it to the films, but it's on the DVD in like deleted scenes. Is it? Yeah. Check that one out. Because that for me was the scene. Um, I remember filming it, and obviously I remember you was at the front, um, Josh and I were at the back. We was like on each side of you, and you're behind me. <laughs> and, 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 and as I say, the first time that that went off, um, it was, like I say, I think they didn't realise how big it, it was. But it was literally like an actual bomb. Um, and I'll never forget, even though we had earplugs, it was so loud. you could still hear them ringing. It like, literally shook right inside me, and I was like, oh my god, they were not jumping around. And then, uh, like I said, being at the premiere, waiting to see that scene, and then and it, it wasn't there. it's not there, and I'm like, but that was such a cool scene! <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, like, honestly, um, yeah, to waste all that gunpowder and to not put it in, it was quite disappointing. <laughs> well, all the footage from the fourth book, would have been nice to have seen, you know, a bit more skills from Crumb. <laughs> and then, um, sadly, in Deathly Hallows Part 1, I came back and um, I took Hermione back from Ron. <laughs> <laughs> David Gates really enjoyed the chemistry we had going on, so he created this love triangle between uh, Crumb, Ron, and Hermione, and we made 
John. Um, John. Um, Ron. Ron. Yeah. Ron. John, John. John. We made Ron really, really jealous, and we had a new dance, and you know, a lot of stuff was going on. But then, when I was sat in the cinema waiting for all that to come up, I never did. But then we didn't make it to the DVD, so um, yeah, I wish they just kept that. But there are photos on the internet proving I've done it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Lexi. I'm a Gryffindor. And my question is actually for all of you. Uh, who do you think was the biggest influence for your character? Anyone or one set or in I, like who you worked with? It honestly depends. Anyone? I know where it been. He, I was very early, my mum was someone, she's not shy, yeah, she, she's not shy, so she'd just go up to anyone, and, and he was someone that offset, you know, he wouldn't <coughs> speak, wouldn't talk, he'd just be in his character. Um, and we had a conversation, he sort of said to me, Lewis, when, you know, I was like, why are you, why are you like you are? Because when, as soon as you're, your wig's off and you're in the car, you're like, you change. He was like, look, when I get out of that car in the morning, when I'm picked up and I get in that car, I get into character and I don't leave until I'm back in the car. Um, so that I think the only advice I can give to you as a young and up and coming actor is, you know, when you get to set, yeah, you want to have fun, you want to have a laugh, but you know, get professional, be professional, get in character, stay in character. Um, and then when you leave the studios or you, you get back in your trailer, you know, go back to being loose. So I think he was a great influence on, on my, my character as Blades, absolutely. I took a, a Percy, I took a lot of Percy just straight from the page, if I'm honest. Um, he, it seemed really obvious what to do with him, uh, because he, especially in the films, he's there, so he's, he's sort of there with what I call sort of, he's, he's there for one note, you know, he's there just to be like, stop running, do this, do that. No Why are you already a prefect of school? And I was a prefect of school. <laughs> So it was like, I know what to do, I know this dude. Like, this is me. Yeah, it basically was me. <laughs> it, was, it was less of an audition and more of a cry for help. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it just, it, it, seemed, it seemed like the obvious thing. But obviously, but back then, we only had three books to go on. So it was like, that's all we'd seen from Percy anyway. We didn't know all of this new stuff. So. That kind of made it a bit harder as we went along because you kind of have to try and back yourself out of the corner you've painted yourself into a little bit. But, I mean, yeah. If, we, if we'd done Percy Weasley in the Deathly Hallows, it would have been a whole other problem. <laughs> fortunately, it's Harry Potter's story and Percy's just kind of there going, Hi. <laughs> I think for well, Pansy, I just took any girl at school, because I, I was bullied all throughout high school and, and before that too in primary school. So I just took any girl who I'd ever had a nasty experience with or who, who bullied me or anything else I'd seen and I just put that into Pansy Parkinson. And that was literally my goal. Yeah. Well, Crumb is Bulgarian and I turned to be Bulgarian too. So I just <laughs> wanted to make my country proud. And, um, <laughs> They're like, where am I? Where's my lines? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
anyone who says, oh, is that that? I just read it cover to cover. You know, lying, all of them. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh, uh, that really sucks. Uh, because your ego, you want to, obviously you want your part to be as big as it can possibly be. Who doesn't? But equally, I kind of, uh, I kind of half get it because it's, and actually when, because I had a long conversation with David Barron, one of the producers about this, when they didn't, when they ended up, because in one of the original script drafts, they had Fred's death scene almost verbatim from the book, and Percy was there and it was there, and then that changed a bit, and then it changed again, and eventually we ended up not seeing Fred's death at all. And as that conversation went through, they talked, obviously they talked to the twins about that, and they talked to me about it as well, and said, look, this is why we're doing it. At the end of the day, the film is called Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. It's not called Fred Weasley and, or Ron Weasley. And if it was Ron's story, the whole sort of, when, you, when you're making a film, you have to look at the sort of the, this is going to get really boring in a second, but not careful, but the sort of the, the, it's Harry's story. And we have to get Harry from his starting point to his ending point. And there are things along the way that happen, especially in books, that don't really bear any particular... Yes, they're interesting, but like Fred's death and Percy coming back, having been away at the Ministry, they don't change what happens to Harry, really, in the long run. He's still got to fight Voldemort and win at the end, regardless of who, like Tom's, Raven's Lupin, everyone who's sort of... All that is happening. It's like it's like it's basically like you've got to get from here to the end of the room. You've got this corridor to get through. And you're Harry Potter, and right at the end of it is the end of the film. And then <laughs> either side of you, there's all this stuff going on. And yes, you can stop and talk to everybody along the way, but it's going to take you days to get to the bottom, or you can just run straight back. That's basically how it goes. And you, yeah, sure, you know, you want you want it to be there. And it's an important moment for Percy, but the fact that he's there is kind of enough for me. I get why we have to kind of walk down the side and not. Go and visit, shake your hands with every single person in the room on the way. Makes sense. I don't know if that even made sound. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hi, my name is Bailey, and despite my costuming, I'm a Slytherin. <laughs> um, and my question is for all four of you: uh, which or all five of you would like to? Um, who do you think was the more intense antagonist between Umbridge and Voldemort? Umbridge. <laughs> she's like he's just he's just nasty. He's like yeah. he's, he's, yes, he's evil. She's vindictive. There's a difference. She's really spiteful. Yeah, like like he just wants every, he just wants everybody to follow him and be a glorious leader. Yeah, totally get that. But whereas she's like <laughs> what? <laughs> whereas she's like isn't she? She's like sort of you've done this, so I'm just going to make your life miserable. And so much pain. Me, me, yeah. me. character of evil, right? He's so over the top. Whereas Umbridge is the kind of villain you're going to meet in your day-to-day -day life. You know? yeah, she's the, yeah, she is the kind of person that you're going to have to deal with. And that, that's the deal. She's a bully. Yeah, she's a nasty. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a Gryffindor, obviously. Great shirt. Um, great shirt. So, oh, thank you. Um, so, along those lines, um, my question is for Chris. Uh, do you think that if Fred hadn't died, and if Percy hadn't been present and come back to his family, he would have continued his insufferable path and become another umbrage? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, because he's already because prior to Fred dying, he's already realised what he's where he's gone wrong. Um, and have, um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think he, I think even by the time, when, when does he write that letter to Ron? That's book five, right? Yeah, when he's like, it's not long, to be honest, I think that's like the peak of him, that's, that's his peak of going in the wrong direction to me. And after that, he's just stuck on this path and he has no idea how he's going to get off it. He's just like, he writes that letter, and I think it's around that time that he kind of, oh, no, sorry, I kind of have to watch my language sometimes. <laughs> He's like, oh crap, I've done this wrong. Ah, but now I'm stuck here. Ah, <laughs> uh, come back down. Uh, uh, you know, he's kind of like that. And then I think 
he spends like a book and a half just going, oh, God, I'm not God. And then fortunately, just at the right moment, takes that deep breath and kind of jumps into a swimming pool and sees, no, sees what happens. No. Unfortunately, it all yeah. turns out all right. And then Fred dies. Um, if Fred and I hadn't died, and the two of them, Fred and George, had kind of continuously immersed us in sort of poked and teased him, he might have brother. probably run away again eventually. But, That's Ron's but, brother. Uh, no, he, he, was, he already knew he was in the wrong way before that. For me, anyway. Thank you. Sorry for that one, Hi guys, uh, my name is Diane, I'm a Slytherin. So, uh, so, by the time I finished reading my very last book, I had pretty much come to terms with everything, except for one thing that still matters to me today. So, for obvious reasons, I always wish it was Percy that died, instead of Fred. <laughs> Die for them, Harry. I'm gonna kill you. Do you think that's 
money? <laughs>